Hey, Retcon Raider here. Well, XO-19 has come and gone, and with it, we've now received our third official trailer for Wasteland 3. Titled 1987, this two-minute trailer strikes a much more serious and somber tone than the original. I think it's fair to say that it was deliberately designed that way to help counter the -the over-the-top silliness of the original E3 trailer. Of course, it was also designed to showcase a fairly significant amount of new teaser material. By my count, it consists of roughly 29 distinct segments, most of them averaging roughly 3 seconds long, but almost all of them showing us something we haven't seen before. That said, let's go ahead and put this thing under the microscope and, uh, see what we can figure out about what InExile might have planned. Oh, but... Before we go any further, just keep in mind, we are going to be delving into some general spoilers here. Nothing too bad. This is all stuff from articles, interviews, fig updates, and a few more obscure sources that you might have overlooked. But for the most part, this is all public information. Still, consider yourself warned. Anyway, first up, we've got what may be one of the most intriguing things about the entire trailer. Namely, its title, 1987. That year actually ties into at least a few of the other details throughout the trailer, and most notably, it marks the year that the official Wasteland timeline diverges from our own. Now, keep in mind that the original Wasteland actually came out in 1988, just as the Cold War was coming towards its end. The original game explored an alternate reality where, between 1987 and 1993, the United States had essentially seized control of the entire Western Hemisphere. This resulted in the Cold War rapidly escalating as they approached the turn of the century. And in 1998, the entire planet was devastated by an abrupt global thermonuclear war. And that actually leads us to the second most intriguing part of this new trailer, namely the choice of music, in this case a cover version of Land of Confusion by Genesis. This is a song that a lot of you might already be familiar with, either thanks to the original version from 1986 or the cover version released by Disturbed in 2005. This particular version was apparently made expressly for the purposes of this trailer performed by Think Up Anger, featuring Stormy Henley, and released on YouTube on November 14th, immediately after the new trailer went live at XO19. As usual, I won't bother playing it here, just in case there are any potential copyright issues, but for those of you who'd like to hear the full version, I'll be sure to include a link in the comments below. Now, going back to the original version of the song, much like Wasteland 1, Land of Confusion was actually released during the final years of the Cold War. It was a song that openly questioned the wisdom of the leaders who had allowed the Cold War to progress as far as it had. Not only that, but just like the original Wasteland, it also seemed to speculate that the entire thing would inevitably lead to a nuclear war. Moving on, the next prominent detail of the trailer is the narrator a radio host who's never actually identified by name. He appears to be doing a simple one-man talk show directed towards the inhabitants of post-apocalyptic Colorado, and it's entirely possible that he might actually appear in the final game. Here, though, he really just serves as a narrative framing device, providing some degree of context, but mostly just helping to tie the various scenes together. Speaking of which, let's start working our way through the actual content of the trailer. We've got a lot of ground to cover here, so we'll try to keep this moving relatively quickly. First up, we've got Segment 1, which serves as the opening segment of the entire trailer. It starts off simply, showing the Kodiak, the Ranger's armed and armored transport, driving out of what appears to be some sort of walled base or settlement. This is most likely either Colorado Springs or Ranger Team November's base of operations, since both of those locations will serve as major quest hubs in Wasteland 3. 
This continues into segment two, which also coincides with the beginning of the music. This segment simply shows a small patch of the snowy Colorado wasteland, complete with a few decrepit and partially collapsed buildings. Like the first segment, this is really just intended to help set the mood for the trailer, likely showcasing some of the background scenery on the world map, similar to the scenery we saw during the driving segment in the Wasteland 3 Alpha. Segment 3, however, is where things really start to get interesting. In this segment, the camera slowly pans over a snowy canyon, complete with what appears to be a partially buried Scorpitron. Although it initially resembles a random jumble of parts, we can actually pick out the Scorpitron's rather distinctive tail, as well as two of its six legs, and its forward-facing sensor systems and arm-mounted weaponry. The peculiar pose and simple fact that all of its weapon systems remain unburied begs the question of whether or not this Scorpitron is truly disabled or simply hiding in a convenient rubble-filled gorge. After all, back in the first Wasteland trailer, we actually saw that Scorpitrons can use ambush tactics, concealing themselves in massive snowbanks or other large enough areas, to catch their prey unawares. It's also worth noting that, although outwardly similar, this Scorpitron doesn't quite match the appearance of the Scorpitron that appears later in the trailer, during Segment 18. That Scorpitron appears to have a slightly different design, including a different set of forward-facing weaponry. A rather unusual detail about this particular segment is that it clearly takes place in the Garden of the Gods, marked by the very distinctive glowing mesas. This is where the patriarch scientists have been experimenting with solar farms to help grow sufficient food to keep the populace of Colorado Springs properly fed. However, it's also intended to be a fairly early location in the main campaign, where the player will have to confront a savage plains gang that's taken the gardens hostage. Given that Scorpitrons are classically considered late-game enemies, it's very strange that one would be waiting here to confront Ranger Team November. If I had to guess, I'd say that this thing was simply placed here purely for the sake of this trailer. Next, we've got Segment 4, which shows a pristine slice of an idealistic settlement, possibly even Colorado Springs. The obvious focus here is this peculiar statue, a vaguely patriotic work which shows a large masculine figure either giving or perhaps even taking an American flag from a smaller, weaker figure. A female figure is standing in the background, watching this exchange take place. Although this scene might be mistaken as uplifting, showing humanity's survival in the midst of a nuclear winter, there are at least a few clues that things aren't quite what they seem. For example, we can clearly see evidence that the statue once portrayed a fourth figure, one who was positioned between the male and female figures, and who has been literally cut off at the knees. What's more, as the camera angle shifts, we can see these three figures off to the right. Although it's hard to make out the precise details, it appears to be a dead or dying man flanked on both sides by two people who are clearly mourning his condition. The fact that no one else seems to be paying them any mind again reinforces the idea that this settlement isn't quite what it seems. Something which is quickly confirmed by the narrator himself, who simply states that diplomacy died when the bombs fell. Now, there's a few ways we could potentially interpret the meaning of this statue, with the most obvious one being that it represents the patriarch, in which case the female figure is most likely meant to be his wife. In that case, the patriarch is either giving control of the Colorado Territory to someone else, likely one of his children, or he's taking it from someone else, likely one of the hundred families that helped establish Colorado Springs. However, if it is intended to be the Patriarch, then it doesn't really explain who the mysterious missing figure might be. Given that we know the Patriarch has three children, it might actually be more logical to assume that this statue is meant to portray them instead, 
again, either giving or taking control of Colorado from someone else. In that case, the largest figure probably represents Valor, while the female figure would represent his daughter, Liberty. That would mean that the missing figure is meant to portray his other son, Victory Buchanan, a drug-addicted serial killer who has clearly fallen from his father's good graces. One final tangent in this scene is this amusing billboard that's just barely visible in the background. Although it's hard to get a good look at it, the text reads, Peak is building a fallout shelter. Poke is building a pool. This is a fairly obvious reference to the classic Aesop's fable, The Ant and the Grasshopper. It farcically represents the importance of proper preparation in the face of impending disaster as illustrated by a pair of amusing cartoon robots. Now, segment 5 is fairly short and simple, showing what could be pretty much any oil field scattered throughout the Colorado Territory. I do actually have a guess as to where this is, but we'll circle back to that a little later in the video. Next up, we've got segment 6, which is actually somewhat unusual. It's the first segment that directly links to multiple follow-up segments, all centered around what appears to be a raider shantytown. Initially, it looks like it could be a normal settlement, but as the camera angle shifts, we're given a good view of a charred human corpse cooking over the fire. What's more, we can also see the figure standing immediately behind the corpse, the one in the red hat, also has what appears to be a flamethrower strapped across his back. While there's not much to go on, it is worth noting that some fairly early teaser material did make reference to a group of cannibals known as the Godfishers. That could be who this group is intended to represent. The idea that these are simply more villains to vanquish is actually reinforced a little later, in segment 15 which actually shows Ranger Team November laying siege to the gates of the very same outpost. You can actually tell it's the same location because, before the Kodiak opens fire, you can just make out the distinctive corpse fire beyond the main gates. This scene actually boils over into two additional segments, segment 19 and 20, which show Team November fighting their way deeper and deeper into the outpost. In fact, in segment 19, you can even see them gunning down the trio of raiders standing around the corpse fire. The corpse fire then makes another appearance in segment 20, as the camera pulls back from a raider who's dramatically wielding a flamethrower. It's interesting to note that Team November actually seems to change their worn gear multiple times throughout this fight, implying that the different scenes were recorded separately, again solely for the purposes of this trailer. However, given the fairly light armament of the opponents they're facing, it's probably safe to assume that, much like the encounters in Aspen or at the Colorado Union Station, this is an area we'll be encountering fairly early in the game. Now, rolling back to Segment 7, this actually gives us a rare glimpse of the Patriarch himself, who was previously featured in Trailer Number 2. His throne room is clearly designed to leave quite an impression on anyone who visits him, including numerous guns, explosives, and no less than 13 American flags scattered around the room. It's also interesting to note the two statues that are visible in this shot. Well, four if you count the busts of himself, but we'll just ignore those for the moment. The first and more obvious statue is that of the Patriarch himself, complete with a sledgehammer shaped like a clenched fist. This is an obvious reference to the Patriarch's notoriously ruthless nature, as previous teaser material has already confirmed that he rules Colorado Springs with an iron fist. The second statue, however, is barely visible until we get to Segment 8, which gives us a much better view. There, just behind the Patriarch's throne, we can see what appears to be a statue of Atlas holding up a wireframe globe. Although the scale doesn't quite match, this appears to be part of the statue that currently sits in front of the Olympic Training Center, conveniently located in Colorado Springs. 
Of course, the statue is just a secondary detail of this particular segment, with the obvious focus being the two portraits near the center of the frame. The portrait on the left displays a group shot of the patriarch and his three children, Valor, Liberty, and Victory Buchanan, who also serve as the catalyst for the main plot of Wasteland 3. As revealed as far back as the original official teaser, each of the Patriarch's children seeks to somehow usurp his kingdom. The Patriarch fears what might happen if any of them get their hands on the vast array of pre-war weapons he has access to, something made even more obvious by the way he's clustered so much of his pre-war arsenal around himself. His fear of losing control of this arsenal is why he ends up inviting the Desert Rangers into Colorado in the first place. Of course, this also adds some context to the statue of Atlas, which is poised directly behind his throne. Despite his own ruthless reputation, it does seem clear that the Patriarch genuinely fears for the future of Colorado Springs, a future that he seems to believe rests squarely on his own shoulders. Now, as we saw back in the Wasteland 3 Alpha, Victory Buchanan is probably the most unpredictable, but also the most ineffectual of the Patriarch's children. Also known as Vic Buchanan, and the Psychopath, he's a drug-addicted serial killer who leads a murderous band of raiders known as the Breathers. One of the earliest missions in the game, which we actually got to play through back in the Alpha, will apparently involve traveling to the old Aspen Ski Resort to capture Victory at the Patriarch's behest. This is part of the Patriarch's agreement between the Rangers and the Patriarch, serving as a requirement before he'll allow them to establish a base in Colorado Springs. It will also present the player with an early, if controversial, opportunity to expand their team, as Victory will be quick to offer his services to the Rangers, rather than facing whatever punishment his father might have in store. As for the Patriarch's other two children, we know less about them. But Brian Fargo and Jerry Kotman did recently reveal a few details during an interview at XO19. The Patriarch's other son, for example, is apparently named Valor, and where Victory ended up running away from home to join a raider gang, Valor instead sought validation by joining the Gippers, a group we'll be exploring a little later in this video. As for the Patriarch's only daughter, her name is apparently Liberty, though much in the same way that Victory was previously known as the Psychopath. Early concept art seems to imply that Liberty might have once been referred to as the Leader. It's certainly an apt name, given that, according to Jerry Kotman, she's the most dangerous of the Patriarch's children, who has actually left Colorado Springs to raise an army. Not only does she intend to use this army to overthrow her father, but she then plans to ruthlessly expand their territory well beyond its current borders. That just leaves the portrait on the right, which I'm assuming portrays the mother of the Patriarch's children. We actually know next to nothing about her, but the simple fact that she's displayed separately from the rest of her family would certainly imply that she's literally no longer in the picture, either dead or perhaps just permanently estranged. Moving on, that brings us to Segment 9, which shows Ranger Team November approaching the Patriarch's throne. Aside from simply giving us a better look at both the Patriarch and his immediate surroundings, it's also interesting to note that Team November seems to consist of five characters during this scene including Scotchmo, who's clearly visible right in the center of the group. In both of the previous games, the default size of the player's squad was seven characters in total, four rangers and three story-based recruits. Back in the Wasteland 3 Alpha, however, the player only got to control a four-man squad, three rangers and one story-based recruit. Although we still don't know if we'll be able to field a full seven-man squad in Wasteland 3, this is certainly encouraging. That brings us to segment 10, which is thankfully much simpler than many of the other segments. In this shot, we can see five hanging corpses 
each poised over a pool of blood and entrails. In the background, we can see the words, Welcome to Colorado, scrawled in blood. This is a fairly basic display, obviously intended to either warn or intimidate new arrivals that they're now entering the Colorado Territory. I suppose the bigger question is exactly who left this warning for the rangers to see. And honestly, I think there's a pretty obvious answer. Given what we saw in the Wasteland 3 Alpha, we already know that victory seems to favor not only killing his victims, but also using their bodies in grotesque displays and leaving cute little messages scrawled in their blood. In fact, this is shown almost immediately afterwards in Segment 11, which clearly shows Victory's flamethrower maze from the September Alpha. Flamethrowers aside, this scene is eerily similar to the one in Segment 10, including both the hanging bodies, as well as the tongue-in-cheek message that was presumably written using their blood. It's also worth noting that this isn't the only segment in the trailer that's ripped straight from the Wasteland 3 Alpha. In Segment 21, you can actually see Ranger Team November showing off several flashy weapons as they face off with Frederico, a high-ranking member of the Breather Gang who also serves as the final obstacle between the Rangers and Vic Buchanan. Another rather familiar scene appears near the very end of the trailer, in Segment 27. This segment clearly takes place near the very beginning of the Wasteland 3 Alpha. You can actually see the welcome sign just behind the Kodiak, which marks the entrance to the Aspen Ski Resort. This is where the player ends up encountering their very first group of breathers, as they navigate their way through the Aspen Ski Resort in search of Vic Buchanan. However, while the location is certainly familiar, the real focus here is our first glimpse at one of the Kodiak's secondary weapon systems. Thanks to Fig Update number 33, we already know that the Kodiak will have access to a variety of different primary weapons. During their recent interview at XO19, In Exile further expanded on that, indicating that the player will also be able to customize the Kodiak with a variety of functional and cosmetic accessories as well, including powerful secondary weapons. In this case, the Kodiak appears to be equipped with a devastating artillery barrage, which blankets a wide area with high-powered explosives. Now, given that we're already on the subject of Aspen and the Breathers, let's jump forward a little to Segment 13. This one is particularly fascinating especially once you realize that it's directly linked to two of the later segments. Taken by itself, this scene shows what appears to be some sort of presentation room or theater, complete with movie-style seating and a still-active slide projector. More notably, the room seems unusually well-guarded, featuring two saw dogs and a massive slicer-dicer, robotic enemies who appeared alongside the breathers back in the Wasteland 3 Alpha. Which actually leads us to segment 14, which shows what appears to be the kitchen of a posh resort or restaurant. A breather is clearly visible near the right side of the kitchen, and blood is prominently splattered across the floor. In the background, we can make out part of a lavish dining area, complete with a second breather who's apparently enjoying a meal. Although intriguing, these scenes don't really come together until we get to segment 24 which starts with Team November running down a blood-splattered hallway. It's immediately obvious that this is, in fact, the same location that was visible back in Segment 14. You can actually see both the dining area and the kitchen on the left side of the screen, as well as multiple breathers who are seemingly oblivious to the ranger's presence. Slightly easier to overlook, however, is the very distinctive carpet pattern which actually matches the carpet we saw back in the theater in Segment 13. That seems to confirm that all three of these segments actually show different areas of the same sprawling location. Given that the area seems to be primarily occupied by breathers, along with their robotic minions, the most obvious assumption is that this is, in fact, some sort of luxury hotel or resort near the Aspen area. 
This assumption is only reinforced as the camera angle changes, showing the rangers approaching a massive vault door. While our focus is naturally drawn to the vault, you can also see the words Deluge of Blood off to the right, along with some sort of grisly poison gas trap concealed in a severed mounted head. This certainly seems to match Victory Buchanan's twisted sense of humor, making it more than a little likely that this is just another part of the Aspen Ski Resort. In fact, that would certainly add some context to some of the other things we can see throughout these three segments. For example, the most prominent item inside the vault appears to be a golden hammer of some sort. If we assume that this is Victory Buchanan's base of operations, then that could very well be the same fist-shaped hammer we saw on the Patriarch statue way back in Segment 7. Perhaps Victory stole it from his father in a misguided act of rebellion, and recovering it might be the subject of one of the Patriarch's later quests. A little easier to overlook is this peculiar detail here, what looks to be some sort of lab, complete with two mutilated bodies suspended in some sort of tubes. It's entirely possible that I'm simply misinterpreting what I'm seeing here, but if we assume that that is some sort of crude lab, it's entirely possible that it might be the source of the highly addictive dream gas that Victory is using to keep the breathers under his control. Rolling back to Segment 12 shows us another somewhat familiar location. In this case, the Colorado Union Station. This is a location that's been teased as far back as 2017, when it served as the central location of A Frosty Reception, a very early concept video showcasing prototype footage of the planned conversation and combat systems. It also made a very brief appearance in the first official trailer, released back in June as part of In Exile's E3 presentation. This is where the player will encounter the Hardheads Gang, a group of raiders led by a grotesquely scarred man named Fishlips. Given the context of the original prototype footage, as well as the details shared in those early fig updates, this seems to be another band of murderous, cannibalistic raiders that the rangers will eventually end up having to deal with. The fact that they're located near Denver implies that this is likely a mid-game quest, after the rangers have already established a presence in Colorado Springs. Next, we've got Segment 16, which shows us a pretty straightforward fight between Ranger Team November and a Plains Gang. Now, we've talked about these guys before, but the Plains Gangs are one of the main antagonists planned for Wasteland 3, as shown in this early promo shot of four of the main villains. According to Fig Update number 25, the Plains Gangs consist at least partially of the old Dorsey clan, one of the hundred families that helped found Colorado Springs. They were exiled en masse after a failed attempt to overthrow the Patriarch and have since waged an endless war on the inhabitants of Colorado Springs, most recently by staging an attack on the Garden of the Gods. I've previously speculated that this character, depicted alongside three of the game's other major villains, might be the current leader of the Dorsey clan. However, given the recent reveal that Liberty, the Patriarch's daughter, has actually left Colorado to raise an army of her own, it's actually possible that this figure is intended to represent her, possibly as the new leader of a unified army of plain savages. One particularly interesting detail in this otherwise simple segment is this thing, what appears to be some sort of mechanical combat platform. We've never actually seen one of these things in any of the previously released material though we have seen some vaguely similar concept art in some of the very early teasers. While this thing does seem more or less in line with the mechanical monstrosities we've seen in several of the other reveals, what makes it unusual here is the simple fact that it's fighting alongside a Plains Gang. According to the developers, the Plains Gangs are intended to serve as fairly early game enemies, 
who make use of relatively crude weaponry and the occasional trained beast. The fact that they're shown here, fighting alongside some sort of heavy combat robot, really seems to go against that original description. Again, this could very well imply that the Plains gangs are slowly being organized and upgraded over time into a more formidable threat, likely by the mysterious Liberty, the most dangerous of the Patriarch's children. Next up, we've got Segment 17, which gives us our first good look at the updated designs for the Gipper's stronghold. Again, we've actually talked about these guys before. They're essentially a cult that worships the memory of God President Reagan. Thanks to some of the earlier reveals, we already know that their headquarters is set up behind the commune at the old Denver airport. This actually provides us with some pretty valuable context for this particular segment. For example, in real life, the Denver airport actually includes a rather expansive stretch of oil fields, including over 70 oil and gas wells. Given that we can clearly see multiple oil wells directly behind this giant statue of Ronald Reagan, it's extremely likely that the oil field shown back in Segment 5 is simply an extension of the Gipper's territory. In fact, some of the earliest reveals over on Fig actually seem to back this up, indicating that if the players ally with the Gippers, it will provide a valuable source of oil for the Desert Rangers. Another rather intriguing detail here is the uh, rather obvious fact that this massive statue of Ronald Reagan is clearly articulated. In fact, if you watch the segment carefully, you can even see the statue moving, implying that it's either some sort of oversized animatronic, or that it's actually a robotic guardian in the form of God President Reagan. This actually makes some degree of sense, given the close proximity to the Denver Airport Commune, which itself is home to a colony of both eccentric artists, as well as a veritable army of mad scientists. One final note here is that this is apparently where Valor, one of the Patriarch's sons, is said to have holed himself up. According to Brian Fargo and Jerry Kopman, Valor felt neglected by his real father and instead turned to God President Reagan for the support he so desperately desired. Although we know he's not the leader of the Gippers, that's an honor apparently reserved for Mother Nancy Reliable, also known as the Patriot, it does seem rather likely that Valor has secured a fairly influential position in the Gipper's organization. Again, this might actually provide us with a little extra context for this particular image, because the third figure on the right is quite clearly an earthly manifestation of God President Reagan. This could very well be Valor, having fully embraced his role as one of the God President's disciples. Heck, even in the original portrait shown back in Segment 8, he does kind of resemble a young Ronald Reagan. After that, we've got Segment 22, another rather intriguing segment that shows a raging battle in what looks to be a mine of some sort. In this case, however, Team November is only present on the periphery of the battle, while the bulk of the fighting seems to be taking place between two groups of robots though at least one of those robots does take a few pot shots at the rangers as they come running by. To make things even stranger, the humanoid robots making up one side of the battle bear an uncanny resemblance to the synths that served as the main villains of Wasteland 2. All of the synths supposedly died at the end of the previous game, and we certainly haven't heard anything about them returning in Wasteland 3. This is definitely one of the more mysterious segments. One possible solution is that the humanoid robots shown here might actually be members of the Scar Collectors, a gang of cyborgs who upgrade their bodies with an assortment of clunky and often faulty implants. However, every other picture we've seen of the Scar Collectors implies that they have a much cruder and piecemeal appearance while the humanoid figures in this segment are much more uniform and symmetrical in comparison. After that, things start winding down as we move into a few shorter, simpler segments. 
First, we've got segment 23, which shows us four members of Team November as they blast open the doors of some mysterious bunker. You can make out an alarm just above the door, as well as a radiation warning off to one side. But there aren't any significant clues about exactly where this might be. It's also interesting to note that once the door is actually open, the rangers clearly aren't entering the same room that they just blasted open. This wire right here actually seems to indicate that they just came from a completely different location. Then we've got segment 25, which is a pretty straightforward glamour shot of three rangers firing off a variety of different weapons, specifically a sniper rifle, a plasma bolter, and a submachine gun. We can't really tell who the rangers are fighting, nor can we tell where they are, though it does look like they're near a railroad track of some sort, for whatever that's worth. Which finally brings us to segment 26, one of the final and most intriguing segments in the entire trailer. In this brief segment, we see Ranger Team November entering a dark warehouse of some sort, and ambushing a pack of red, monstrous creatures that are clustered around a bloodied corpse. This is our very first glimpse at a new, monstrous enemy in Wasteland 3, and it doesn't really resemble anything we had back in Wasteland 2. However, if we go all the way back to the original Wasteland from 1988, we can actually find a rather similar creature, the Skinless Drools, that once infested the abandoned mine shaft just to the west of the original Ag Center. In fact, this was pretty much confirmed during In Exile's recent appearance at XO-19. There, they actually outright stated that some of the classic enemies from the original Wasteland would be making a return appearance, including the Star Wars-inspired Waste Worms, as well as the monstrous humanoid Drools. Of course, back in the original game, these things were portrayed as fairly weak, low-level enemies for fledgling rangers to cut their teeth on. Here, however, they certainly sport a much more fearsome demeanor, implying that, much like the Slicer Dicers, they might have gotten a significant power boost since their original appearance. And with that, we're pretty much done. Segment 28 is little more than a slow tracking shot of the Kodiak as it winds its way through the Colorado wastes. The narrator winds down his show, warns about the dangers of cannibalism, and the screen fades to black, giving way to one last reveal, the game's planned release date on May 19th of 2020. Now, uh, overall, I have to say... I am truly impressed by just how much content In Exile managed to fit into a single two-minute trailer. Much like the first trailer, they not only gave us a broad cross-section of what to expect, but they also managed to do it with a minimum of repeated content. It really does seem to support Brian Fargo's recent claims that Wasteland 3 will sport a 50-hour campaign. That said, there's really not much else to talk about for now. Oh, sure, there are certainly other recent teasers that I could spend some time going over, but I do need to save something for future video projects. For now, this is Redcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember... Although I do love talking about Wasteland 3, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube channel, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on FIG. Links are in the description.